Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today. We're, we're both, I think, really excited to be here. Um, you know, it was nice that you started off with what made you smile, the last thing you ate that made you smile for, for me. It was a Nutrigrain bar, but other folks, it was a much more interesting thing. So um, wonderful to meet all of you. Again, my name is Kanoko Sai. I'm the Associate Regional Director for the ADL Pacific Northwest. Um, and I'll let Scotty introduce herself as well. Scotty. Hi, sorry, but my it had disappeared. So I'm Scotty Nash. I'm the education director for the ADL Pacific Northwest. I'm so excited to get to, I love working with my colleague Kendall um, and co-presenting programs. And I'm thrilled to be working with Amanda again as well. Uh, we look forward to our time and our session with you. Um, and I just wanted to briefly start by sharing ADL's mission. Um, the ADL's mission has been the same since the organization started in 1913, and it was to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment to all. Um, in this time where we have the trial of Derek Chauvin and we have a rise in anti-Asian hate, I think it's really important that we recognize and acknowledge that we work hard to secure just and fair treatment to all and that the, the action of allyship is just that it's an action it's not a noun it's not stagnant it's something that we're always doing and as we think about the rise of conspiracy theory and hate um how can we show up as educators to support our students and stand together so with that i'm going to turn it over to kendall to talk a little bit more about how we do this work absolutely so as Scotty mentioned um the second half of our mission is securing justice and fair treatment for all so how do we do that uh, we like to think of it in four separate buckets, um, advocating, engaging, educating, and investigating, um, and all trying to, attempting to really fulfill our goal of fighting hate for good. Um, you know, we advocate through our legislative means, whether it be in Olympia or Salem, um, to pass bills that uh, advocate for anti-hate initiatives, so our rights um, legislation, a number, a number of different things, um, but advocating is like a major thing that we do as an organization. We also like to engage. Uh, we have a huge um, constituency of folks that we engage in here in the Pacific Northwest. We cover five, five states here in the Pacific Northwest, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, and Alaska. And uh, we try to engage our networks by ensuring that, um, you know, they're, they're getting out there and, and really um, showing up for all communities. You can see in this photo, this is MLK Day March last year um, before COVID hit. And, you know, we try to create opportunities for our constituency to engage in to ensure that uh, we're, we're walking the walk in a uh, literal sense almost. Um, the third thing that we do is educate, right? So Scotty is our director of education where we engage in K through 12 schools around school climate initiatives, anti-bias work and professional development for educators. Um, and, and also ensuring that we're really thinking about how are we teaching our youngest so, uh, some of these values of inclusion and respect. Um, the fourth thing that we do is investigating. So uh, one of the major things that ADL is known for is the work that our Center on Extremism does in investigating um, you know, domestic terrorism, extremism, um, and some of these white nationalist, white supremacy groups that exist here pretty prevalently um, in the Pacific Northwest. And so uh, when an act of hate happens in your community, we always want to know about it. And we work closely with the Oregon Department of Justice um, bias crimes coordinator uh, that you have to, to ensure that law enforcement takes it seriously at the same time as we're ensuring that um, we're investigating it properly through our ADL investigators as well. Scotty, thanks, next slide. Kendall. Yeah, thanks, Kendall. So um, we always uh, begin our work by also really sharing what we believe, and we believe that bias is universal. Um, everybody has it. So understanding what it is and how it's impacting us in terms of our dynamics with power and privilege, we believe is super important. Um, change is a process. So uh, we're not going to know exactly what to do at the end of a 90 minute workshop. Um, it's going to take time and we're going to do that by working together. Uh, diversity is strength. Uh, we know and learn a lot more when we have people with different backgrounds in the room. 
And we really value that and how to work with people who are different than us. And we, we work with that in terms of also developing common language around understanding what is bias, what is prejudice, what is, what is conspiracy. Um, so we'll do some language today as well. And then finally, prejudice is learned and therefore we believe it can be challenged and overcome. So when we talk about conspiracy or when we've talked about extremism or when you did your work with the Western State Center to learn about different ways that students are coming in, we again, we know that prejudice is learned and therefore we believe it can be unlearned, it can be challenged and it can be overcome. And so we like to approach our work with that um, asset-based mindset. So we are gonna, um, dive a little bit more into understanding conspiracy theory. And I'm going to um, have uh, Kendall lead us through uh, a number of really important pieces. Sure. Thanks, Scotty. So um, we don't have a poll, but we do have a list. And so um, to really get us started and to really understand where we are as a group, um, it'd be wonderful to know you know, uh, you know what people's knowledge is uh, is about conspiracy theories. What conspiracy theories do you know about? Um, I'm not asking what you believe in necessarily. I'm asking what you know. And so I've listed a number of them. So in the chat, because I love to engage folks in the chat, is um, how many of these different conspiracy theories that I've listed do you know about? Um, so things like flat Earth. JFK, JFK was killed by the CIA. The moon landing was filmed by a, in a Hollywood studio. 9-11 was an inside job. QAnon, Bigfoot exists. The Holocaust didn't happen. Uh, the COVID-19 vaccine has 5G microchips. These are all conspiracy theories that are just like floating around right now. And so it looks like in the chat, unfortunately, all of them seems to be a pretty um, common answer and unfortunately these are these are pretty uh mainstream ones i would say that are are out there um obviously the more recent one being the COVID 19 vaccine has 5g microchips that's tracked by bill gates um these are all conspiracy theories uh, that live out there scotty can you go to the next slide yes the jewish lasers that's another interesting one that we have heard about and yes the QAnon documentary is super interesting. Um, we can talk a little bit about that, about that later. But I think, um, you know, with that understanding of where we are and understanding, you know, how prevalent some of these conspiracy theories are that, that a lot of us have heard about is really uh, codifying and really understanding or galvanizing around a common description, right? So ADL's just definition of conspiracy theories and why it matters is we say it's a false interpretation of a matter that explains the subjects as a result of a, of a conspiratorial undertaking, right? Um, conspiracy theories often emerge from the desire to seek larger, more complex answers to incidents that are actually relatively straightforward in nature. They can also be created by people seeking to delegitimize unwelcome events. Um, and, and why does this matter? It matters because conspiracy theories throughout history have been used to demonize groups of people, at, as well as you know, conspiracy theories that center around anti-Semitism, racism, xenophobia, kind of this othering of people um, that has really demonized them throughout history and has had really, really dire consequences. Uh, next slide, please, Scotty. And so when we, this might be a little bit hard to see, um, but again, I can send the slides out afterwards, but this is kind of a conspiracy chart, right? That has made the rounds um, on social media pretty much over the last year or so. It's, uh, if you look very closely um, at the bottom, there are some uh, more uh, conspiracy theories that have actually happened. And as you progress your way up, it gets to be more and more absurd, right? Um, there's a speculation line, leaving reality, science denial, and there's like this anti-Semitic point of no return. And you know, those are the kind of the theory, conspiracy theories like QAnon and the Illuminati and Pizzagate and Flat Earth, things that are clearly false and very detached from reality, right? Um, next slide, please. Great. So why do these conspiracy theories kind of take root? Where do they come from? Um, so according to Karen Douglas, who's a PhD at the University of Kent in the United Kingdom, 
And this is how most psychologists kind of frame conspiracy theories in a psychological motive kind of way, is that there are three motives, right? The first motive is epistemic, right? There's this need uh, for knowledge and certainty to satisfy a desire for information. So when something major happens, when a big event happens, people naturally want to know what happened, right? They want an explanation and they want to know the truth, uh, but they also want to feel certain of that truth. Uh, the second one motive is existential. The people, when people need to feel safe and secure in the world that they live in, um, they want to feel like they have some kind of autonomy over their lives, some kind of semblance of control. I know during COVID, for example, like a lot of people are not feeling that kind of way right now because um, we're all living under uh, some, you know, some very uh, strict health guidelines that are very important. Um, but people don't want to feel powerless. Uh, they don't like to feel like they don't have control. And so um, at least allowing people to have, feel like they have that information, that they have control over that flow of information, that's the second motive, existential. And then the third motive, it's social, right? The desire to feel good about themselves as individuals and in a group, right? Having this superior <laughs> Uh, self-esteem almost, right? To, that they feel good about themselves, that they know this thing that other people don't know, um, that it's kind of this exclusivity thing to them. They wanna feel uh, better about themselves. Uh, and so all three motives are used in a way um, to explain why conspiracy theories have really kind of popped up. And so if we look at the next slide, which is, talking about a very common anti-Semitic conspiracy theory that, for example, Jews have too much power, right? There was um, ideas and fears about Jewish power have been around for, for a really long time. Um, you know, in the 20th century, there was a publication of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is a false, elaborate forgery uh, reporting a supposed meeting that never occurred that says that of the, you know, a Jewish conspiracy to rule the world, right? And they've been falsely revealed um, as a purported Jewish plan for global domination, how they would take over industries, infiltrate governments, and really use their stranglehold on the media to advance their hidden agenda. Um, again, no such meeting ever occurred, but this document, and this document is pure fiction, but it's been used for, uh, for centuries to demonize Jews in a way that, you know, has resulted in violence, you know, uh, murder and all kinds of different things. And so I think, you know, when we look at the three epistemic existential and social motives, right? The epistemic is knowledge that Jews, you know, knowledge of like, why are things happening? The knowledge that Jews have a plan to control the world. Existential, finding someone to blame for their problems, right? Scapegoating, which is a common tactic that we're seeing during the COVID-19 lockdown against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, and then social, right? Feeling better about the actions of, in their hatred, justifying themselves, right? Saying, oh, they have this evil plan. And so it's okay that I'm doing this really bad, hateful actions toward them. Th these are a common pattern that we have seen throughout history. Um, if we see on the next slide that, um, you know, like I said before, today we're talking about how APIs are being scapegoated and blame, blame for COVID-19. There's a lot of uncertainty out there in the world right now uh, around COVID-19. A lot of people are really scared um, and people want to know what, what's going on and what's going to happen next, right? Knowledge of where COVID-19 came from, that kind of thing is epistemic. Existential is finding comfort or answers during this time of extreme anxiety. Um, and then social, justification of acting out through hateful actions. We, you know, as we have seen, uh, Asian American Pacific Islanders have been spit on, refused service, uh, physically assaulted, verbally assaulted, murdered, everything across the spectrum over the last year, blaming them for COVID-19. And so, you know, these conspiracy theories that, and, and using rhetoric like the Wuhan flu and Kung flu and things like that are really harmful to the community. And then the last example that I have on the next slide uh, would be the QAnon theory. Um, I'm sure that there are a number of people that have seen the HBO documentary that, that has been uh, showing every Sunday recently. It's fascinating. Um, but QAnon is this conspiracy theory 
um, that there's this large pedophilia, sex trafficking, um, uh, that our leaders are pedophiles and they sex traffic children and drink the blood of children. And that, um, you know, that Donald Trump plays a, it's still president and that, um, you know, there have been theories out there that he switched faces, like he had a face transplant with Joe Biden. And so really Joe Biden is, is Donald Trump. It's, it's wild, right? Clearly false. Um, but, you know, people want to have that knowledge of, of understanding like what's going on in the world. Why are, who, why are our leaders in power and what are they doing in power? And so epistemic knowledge about the global elite who are controlling the world and, and running a pedophile sex trafficking ring, which is again, absurd and completely false. Existential, finding meaning, why things are happening in our government and finding those and those in leadership. In social, there's this feedback loop with QAnon. Right, that on the internet that that's very participatory uh, in finding new clues that that Q, this QAnon, this person who is close to the government, top echelons of government, uh, knows like these secrets, um, and, and really the participatory nature of the conspiracy theory for um, you know believers um, that there's hidden messages in these uh, from Q, uh, who's that person in government. And it feels good to be in the know and to be uh, you know, essentially red pilled, taking the red pill, quote unquote, it's kind of a reference to the matrix and really understanding reality as it is. And so QAnon started very fringe and very like small, but, but as we saw on January 6th, it snowballed its way into a very violent and um, you know consequential conspiracy theory that has become a lot more mainstream, unfortunately. And so again, we see those three motives playing out over and over and over. And I see someone in the chat saying, you know, they reinforce each other with human sense making and pattern recognition drives, right? That's the social thing. So I would say um, that's how we, how we look at conspiracy theories at a very psychological level. But why are they happening now? So why is there a rise of conspiracy theories now? Why have we seen this rise? Um, and so... I, you, you know, we can break it down in a number of different ways um, in why this is happening, but um, we can talk about one of the theories is the rise of tribalism, right? The epistemic benefit is essentially, especially important, right? That tribal epistemolo epistemology in which information is evaluated not based on conformity to common standards of evidence, but on whether your community or quote unquote tribe advocates for it, right? So it's certainly disturbing when elected leaders, individuals, um, people who control a, a political party or a political movement believe that these certain conspiracy theories exist. In fact, there are a number of people in Congress that have openly uh, endorsed or shown that they believe in QAnon. Um, and these are elected leaders that run our government. And so naturally, there's this rise of tribalism where people who feel like they're on the, the same team want to feel like they believe the same thing. And so people are starting to gravitate toward um, these more fringe ideology because their leaders are, um, and the people that represent them within their tribes uh, believe these, these conspiracy theories as well. The second idea of why conspiracy theories are kind of on the rise here is because false information spreads faster than truth. We've seen this through studies. As you can see, this is a, uh, a chart that was done by researchers at MIT about true, false, and mixed political rumor cascades on Twitter. So these sort of large influxes of tweets that have to do with um, you know, false information or true information or mixed information. And as you can see throughout time, um, throughout these major events that people are, again, are trying to explain, that people are trying to understand a little bit better, um, there have been some serious um, spikes in the false narrative and it has often and most of the time outnumbered the true narratives. Uh, and so, you know, when you, when you look at this, this chart, it's unsurprising. To see this, and most of most of, when you read the paper, it actually has mostly to do with people retweeting 
in particular are amplifying false narratives. They don't, so this is why it's so important to think uh, and research and understand the source of information. I'm sure Scotty will talk a little bit about misinformation later, is really thinking critically about how are we uh, consuming our information, right? And not just open, just quickly retweeting things out into the void because it, it happens. Um, and people want to be first to be to to the knowledge. And that's why, false, again, false information is so much easier to disseminate than true information that's nuanced. And then the third thing that we would say is social media enablers. There's this role in uh, so of social media to that has amplified uh, conspiracy theories beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, when you look at Facebook, Facebook just last year in 2020 banned Holocaust denial. In 2020, right? So that means from the time it was incepted to the until last year, Holocaust denial lived on Facebook and you could openly join uh, Holocaust denial groups uh, that, that spouted these, these conspiracy theories. You know, there's uh, anti-vax groups, which were recently banned on Facebook, lived on Facebook until just this year. Uh, you know, there were a number of different things that have lived on mainstream social media platforms that have, that have enabled people to really un to understand some of these more uh, fringe ideology. Um, individuals like Alex Jones, who's here in the middle with a literal tinfoil hat, um, has been spouting conspiracy theories for years, right? And he profits off of a lot of the this this false and misinformation and disinformation. And a lot of these people who are on YouTube, as you you probably saw in the Q and on uh, documentary, is the a lot of these Q tubers, as they are called, uh, profit off of their conspiracy off of conspiracy theories and having an audience with people who believe these very absurd outlandish ideas. And so again, social media has allowed these things to live on their platforms. Uh, next slide. Next slide is a role or it is a video about social media's role. And this is, um, if you don't recognize them, this is Sasha Baron Cohen. He uh, is an actor, um, a comedian, and he spoke at ADL's uh, Never Is Now conference two years ago, I think in 2019. Uh, it's ADL's conference on anti-Semitism. And he was given an award, but he really drove home the point about social media's influence, about misinformation, disinformation, and conspiracy theories. And I think what he talked about is, is so eloquent. And so I'm gonna let him explain uh, what social media has done to us as a, as a society. So go ahead, Scotty. The greatest propaganda machine in history, let's think about it, Facebook, YouTube, and Google, Twitter, and others, they reach billions of people. The algorithms these platforms depend on deliberately amplify the type of content that keeps users engaged. It's why fake news outperforms real news, because studies show that lies spread faster than truth. Today, Around the world, demagogues appeal to our worst instincts. Conspiracy theories once confined to the fringe are going mainstream. It's as if the age of reason, the era of evidential argument is ending, and now knowledge is increasingly delegitimized and scientific consensus is dismissed. Hate crimes are surging as are murderous attacks on religious and ethnic minorities. Now, what do all these dangerous trends have in common? I'm just a comedian and an actor. I'm not a scholar. But one thing is pretty clear to me. All this hate and violence is being facilitated by a handful of internet companies that amount to the greatest propaganda machine in history. On the internet, everything can appear equally legitimate. Breitbart resembles the BBC. The fictitious protocols of the elders of Zion look as valid as an ADL report, and the rantings of a lunatic seem as credible as the findings of a Nobel Prize winner. Voltaire was right when he said, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. And social media lets authoritarians push absurdities to billions of people. I believe that it's time for a fundamental rethink of social media and how it spreads hate 
conspiracies and lies. Now, last month, however, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook delivered a major speech that, not surprisingly, warned against new laws and regulations on companies like his. Well, some of these arguments are simply, pardon my French, bullshit. Now, if a neo-Nazi comes goose-stepping into a restaurant and starts threatening other customers and saying he wants to kill Jews, would the owner of the restaurant, a private business, be required to serve him an elegant eight-course meal? Of course not. The restaurant owner has every legal right, and indeed, I would argue, a moral obligation to kick that Nazi out. And so do these internet companies. In, in every other industry, a company can be held liable when their product is defective. When engines explode or seatbelts malfunction, car companies recall tens of thousands of vehicles at a cost of billions of dollars. It only seems fair to say to Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, your product is defective. You are obliged to fix it, no matter how much it costs, and no matter how many moderators you need to employ. So that is um, probably the most eloquent way we can talk about solving some of our issue, because I think, you know, when, it, when Sasha Baron Cohen has talked about it, because we are a home, because we're all on the internet a lot more, I feel like during COVID-19, people have a lot more access to these, to information. And, um, you know, again, getting it right really matters. And so I'm going to hand it over to Scotty to really talk about how do we address this in our classrooms and with our students? So Scotty, toss it over Great. to you. Thank you so much, Kendall. Um, to, honestly, if you can find his whole, I don't know if it's out on the regular world, but he did uh, Sasha Baron Cohen's entire uh, keynote that year was really spectacular, um, really thoughtful and intentional. So Kendall, thank you so much for giving us that overview and glimpse into conspiracy theory. And as an educator, I sit there and I think now that I know this, what can I do about it? How do I help my students really engage in understanding what all of this means? So my first question to you is, what, what is cyber hate? How am I transitioning from conspiracy theory to cyber hate? So go ahead in the chat and define what is cyber hate? How would you define it? What is it? How would you notice it? Put in a couple words or a phrase or a sentence to capture your thinking around what is cyber hate? So I see the word trolling, hate speech online, using the internet, um, bigotry uh, guys this conversation, using the internet to spread information, um, uh, the idea of lies, and um, really thinking about some of these different pieces um, that we heard from Kendall. Um, what I'm going to share with you is that uh, ADL defines cyber hate. Um, as this following, any use of electronic communications technology that attacks people based on their actual or perceived race, ethnicity, national origin, religion, sex, gender, sexual orientation, disability or disease to spread, um, disability or disease to spread bigoted or hateful messages or information. So the piece of that that you can see that we're gonna to connect to later is all different aspects of one's identity. So cyber hate is this idea of attacking someone based on their identity. And I think a lot of um, the, the, from the examples that Kendall was talking about, whether we're um, spreading lies about uh, Jewish people or we're spreading lies about a political people who identify with a political party, that's a choice identity, but it's still part of somebody's identity. So really thinking about um, 
the, the hatred that spread. And using electronic communication technologies such as the internet and all of the social network working pieces as well. What I put in the chat there for you, and these will be shared um, when Amanda shares uh, the follow-up email from this session, but I've put some specific resources in there that help us to think about how are we going to define cyber hate with students? What does it mean and how, um, you know, what can we do about it? Um, how do we handle social pressure? And so these are different resources that we have that specifically connect to this idea of cyber hate. What do we know and what can we do? Okay, so here's my next question for you in the poll. Is all speech protected speech? So as we think about the First Amendment and the freedom of speech, is all speech protected speech? Go ahead and enter into the chat, yes, no, or I don't know. Excellent. I'm definitely seeing the trend of most people so far who are just entering, no, it's not. And I think that this is something that's always super interesting to students to understand, and even adult peers, um, that this idea of what is protected speech. So what I want to share with you is that we do, we have the Constitution and the First Amendment, and that's that idea of the free, free speech, right? And we go and we unpack the First Amendment. I remember doing that as a high school teacher and thinking about all the things that students could say. Now, I taught that 20 years ago, and the internet was not the phenomenon that it is now. So I'm sure that you're having much more interesting conversations in your classrooms about it than I did. But what I want to share here in, is really this piece about the government and the internet. The government cannot prohibit most speech, even if it is hateful, because the U.S. Constitution's First Amendment guarantees the right of freedom of speech and press to all Americans. However, the government does not control the internet and companies like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, they can establish their own rules regarding speech and what is acceptable. And that connects specifically to what Sasha Baron Cohen was saying. There has been no rule or regulation. So yeah, yelling fire in a crowded theater, that could potentially cause harm and danger, right? So very specific action and reaction to that. However, when the hate speech is on the internet and it lives out there, that immediacy of action and reaction is a little bit different. And so what we do is when we're looking at these internet companies that Sasha Baron Cohen was referring to so beautifully in what he spoke about, we need to think about two things. We wanna think about the terms of service. So that is what the platform itself has um, that they can address it with. So as we saw recently, people being removed from Twitter. The terms of service is what you sign, right, when you create an account, and you have to agree to those. And if you violate those terms of service, then we know it can be reported, it, will be it, it can be reviewed, and you can be removed. So kids who are playing, um, I have two sons, and one of them is really into Fortnite right now, and one of his friends was being kind of a jerk. And he was like, should I report this? And I said, now let's hold on, right? Like, what do we need to think about in terms of your friends being kind of a jerk online versus like the broader idea of terms of service of let's remove someone who's being genuinely inappropriate, right? So we have to have that. And um, the, the next piece is that even though speech on major internet platforms is not protected by the constitution, what we do is we want to encourage and suggest that we use the opportunity of counter speech. So when we see or read or hear hate speech, how do we respond to it in an active and actionable way? So I think about um, all those next door websites and you all, you know, everybody gets somebody on there who's posting all of this, you know, insanity. Um, and so how do you respond? It's not about engaging in the conversation with that person, but it's simply about putting out the alternate, the, the alternate to what those ideas were that was put on there. So terms of service is something that the company control and counter speech is obviously something that we can control and begin to have a conversation about. So I just wanted to put that out there in terms of contextualizing and connecting to a lot of what we heard from Sasha Baron Cohen and thinking about um, how conspiracy theory is spreading so quickly now with the rise of of virtual media, really. 
So what are some prevention strategies that we can use in our classrooms? And so I'm gonna go through each of these four prevention strategies and share different ideas and resources with you as we go through them. So the four strategies that I think about when we talk about how do we begin to address conspiracy theory in our classroom and what our students are taking away and what they might be understanding. So one piece is to listen and observe. So I'll go through that. And then I'm gonna talk about teaching and modeling media literacy. And that really does get back to a lot of what Kendall was saying and what Sasha Baron Cohn were saying in terms of what do we see on the internet? What's real, what's not? Um, how the importance of promoting civics education and we'll directly connect that to January 6th as an example. And then the last piece is about embedding anti-bias education and skills into the school curriculum because the idea is, is that hate speech is connected so frequently to an aspect of someone's identity. So how do we help our students realize that we don't want to hate somebody based on their identity? We don't want to hate the period, but really bringing in that, um, uh, uh, that, that one um, piece. So to listen and observe. So what I want to think about when we're talking about listen and observe is that we know that there are different stages in the radicalization spectrum. And I think that my guess is that at some point, the Western State Center really highlighted that in their last session. So I'm not gonna go through that. The slide is here and it's a little bit fuzzy. So if you want more information, the Western State Center has great information on that as do we have more information on this. But the idea is that we wanna think about radicalization or connecting to conspiracy theory and feeling connected and identifying with that in these various stages where um, we might start with a sense of vulnerability and that's why we're receptive to it, right? And then it moves through the ideological to the motivated, then you're planning and you're activated, right? So these conspiracy theories are working by targeting vulnerable students. So what's really important is that we wanna pay attention to students who are identifying or acknowledging some sense of vulnerability to you. So if we see that, it's super important. Scotty, can I pause you just there for a second? Because I just, yeah. I think it's really important while we're in remote teaching right now, how do we observe students mm. when we can't see their faces or what's in their background? So not that I'm even expecting you to answer that, but I'm thinking maybe in the chat, this is a really great opportunity for teachers to share, like, how are they how are they observing and connecting with their students during this remote teaching to learn if they are vulnerable? Yes, so I think that that's a great piece to be thinking about. And Jennifer, I'll address your uh, piece about media literacy in just a little, in a, in a few minutes as well. But um, the piece in terms of vulnerability, I will say some things that we know we wanna look for are students who are never really showing any presence or connection to classroom kids who are who aren't connected to an adult in the in the school the virtual school in some way or space so paying attention to kids who aren't turning work in aren't connecting with other people paying attention to school social media platforms those are some initial indicators um, but certainly not the only one. So certainly as you get a sense of identifying kids who might be vulnerable in the space of distance, sharing those ideas in the chat are a great idea, Amanda, thank you. Um, the second piece is to be aware of symbols, pay attention to drawings and writings that students submit. The virtual connection to that is pay attention to things that people are putting in the chat. The chat is an interesting space and place where just like with other online hate speech and, and rise of conspiracy theory, it's easy to put it out there because it's not being connected to your visual space and place, right? You're somewhat distanced from it. So pay attention to that. And then in terms of the hate symbols um, and drawings, I know that that's connected specifically to every student belongs. And we do have some lessons that we will be sharing around hate symbols as well as a connection to our hate symbols database. So make sure you're aware of those. You look at the, the, the law is there to protect and think about, or the rule. I know it's not a law, sorry, Amy. Um, I know it's just a rule, but the idea is, is that how are we protecting our students? It's through an awareness and listening and observing when they are connecting to something that represents that hatred. 
Another way to really think about listening and, just, and um, observing is using the format that we present in what we call our table talk. So it's a discussion strategy and it's thinking about that framing of very intentional listening. So uh, thank you, Maureen, great ideas. Um, we like to make sure what do people know, right? And so we start with that idea of what is the topic summary? How are students connected? What do we know? And we ask those questions to expand and understand that we're all on the same page. And we never make fun of or disregard what somebody shares. But if something is shared that is somewhat um, inappropriate or inaccurate, um, it's an opportunity for us to hear that and to respond to that by saying, perhaps we should check another source. Or where did you get that information? Can we look at this place too? Or I hear you say this, this is what I heard. Okay, so making sure that you're summarizing and engaging around a common, common topic. Then you come up with some questions to um, in, start a conversation. So what I want you to notice here on the right is that one of the things that Kendall mentioned earlier and that we've all talked about is this idea of what is propaganda and why does it matter? And so we have some of these lessons. So we have a table talk specifically and a lesson plan as well around what is propaganda. How do we understand what it is? So we all get on the same page about it. And then we might ask some questions to start that conversation, to engage in the conversation. How are propaganda and advertising similar or different, right? Then we dig a little deeper. Have you ever been influenced by propaganda? What do you think we might wanna do about it? Um, we open that, um, do deeper open-ended questions. Then the last piece is this idea of taking action. So now that we know what we know, what do we do about it? So just like today's session, now that we know what we know from Kendall about conspiracy theory and the fact that there's a history of it and it's spreading really quickly through technology, for instance, is one way of it spreading, is what do we do? We start to teach our students and provide opportunities to have conversation about it. So this first um, set of strategy really has to do um, with listening and observing. And note that some of these lesson plans that are on this slide to the right can all be found in our website and ways to specifically talk about um, these different pieces. The next strategy that I talked about is this idea of teaching and modeling um, media literacy. So I'm gonna ask a quick question I want you to put in the poll. Where do you get your news? Where do you get your news? So if you're following the trial about Derek Chauvin, if you are um, paying attention to um, what's happening in Georgia around voting rights and more likely restrictions, what are some things that we can pay attention to? Okay, so I see New York Times, I see Seattle Times, NPR, John Oliver, different websites, okay, news websites. So how does this differ than where we think our students get their news? Breaking news app, yep, I have that one too. So here's multiple sources, Stephen Colbert. So where do our students get their news? So put in the chat, where do we think our students are? Yep, TikTok, social media, Instagram, Twitter, Right, and so we know that that's different, right? That those are different pieces. Now, it doesn't mean that there can't be truth on TikTok or social media. They're friends, right? They're parents, right? They're all different places. It doesn't mean that those platforms don't have truth and accuracy, but what it means is how do we engage with our students around what is truth and accuracy? So we wanna teach strategies like checking new sources, right? New York Times is great, it's a little left-leaning. So how do we counter that with something that might be a little bit right-leaning so that as we're looking at maybe some of those op-ed pieces versus those fact-checked pieces, how do we look at those together? We look for clues in terms of what kinds of evidence is really um, ex expanded on in terms, what is the evidence? Where's the data coming from? 
we work with our students to spot fake news and we talk about the spectrum of news sources. What is, you know, right down the middle versus what's right, what's left? What does right versus left even mean? How do we get a balance of? Um, and so it's not that social media is bad, it's how do we use social media and understand it for accuracy? So the idea here is that what we can see in these two charts, right, is that 45% of teens say they're online almost constantly. So that is a lot of time. We know that our students are walking around with their phone all the time. More Americans get news from social media than print newspapers. So we have to work with our students in terms of how to understand it. So fake news, how do we know it's fake? How do we know it's real? When we're saying pay attention to the details, what do we need to know? We need to know this, misinformation versus disinformation. So misinformation is false information that is spread regardless of whether there is intent to mislead. Disinformation is false information which is intended to mislead especially propaganda by a government organization to rival uh, to a rival power in the media. And so one of the things we like to talk about, and I'm again gonna put a couple websites into the chat here for you in terms of understanding where do we get our news? Is it fake? Is it accurate? Um, two different pieces that I'm sharing with you is that the first one is um, our partnership that I'm gonna dive into in just a few minutes with Bytes Media, which is about teaching civics education. And there are lots of individual lessons there. And one of those pieces that is bridging this gap between teaching about media literacy, as well as civic responsibility is this idea of fake news and what can we do about it? And so in that lesson plan, there are lots of ways in which we talk about how to accurately find and read news sources. And then the second one is this idea of um, tools and strategies around understanding the dangers of disinformation. And so really thinking about this idea of, you know, it's one thing to have false information. It's another thing to have false information, which is intended to mislead. There's a very different tone and texture there. And when we think about conspiracy theory, it leans more in this idea of dis disinformation. So then the last um, part of this media literacy piece that I want to share in terms of our transition into promoting civics education is this idea about understanding and outsmarting propaganda and extremism and online recruitment, because that's where this is all coming from. And so what we're doing here is we're beginning in terms of um, if we share these next couple lessons that I want to share with you is that in terms of um, this first one is a table talk. So when we think about this idea that I shared with you earlier in terms of making sure that we all have the same information and then we ask questions to engage and then we dive deeper, there's a whole table talk that we have around understanding and outsmarting propaganda extremism and online recruitment tactics. So we specifically in there make sure that we're on the same page about understanding what is extremism. What is terrorism? How are they similar? How are they different? How does this connect to conspiracy theory? And then when you do that in terms of thinking about it, you can have that conversation in your classroom, but you could also share that resource home so that families can engage in that conversation as well. We can't answer everything and fix everything in the classroom. That communication home is super important. We also have to acknowledge that communication home helps parents to raise heightened alert around being aware of something they may not even be thinking about right now. It is a village to raise each and every child. So by sharing a table talk home and that link home, the conversation around language is gonna be the same in the classroom as it is gonna be at home. Scotty, I have a yeah. quick question for you before we move on to civics. Mm -hmm. um, and so, the term fake news, I know certain teachers that I've spoken to um, or even students that I've, I've worked with, it has become really complicated because it's now 
it can be seen as anything that goes against what I believe is fake news. Right. And so it's, it's not like cancel culture. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if you can just speak a little bit about that and maybe specifically also, and if you get to this later on with evidence, how can we specifically use this term evidence to help people understand what is like fact versus belief versus fallacy? Um, because again, I think that these people who are really engaging in fake news believe, truly believe that what they are reading is evidence. Right. And I think that people who are putting the news out there too, right? It, I was just, um, was about to say exactly that. Thank you. Mm. Um, which is the idea is that fake news was introduced as a term to delegitimize de legitimize honest journalism, right? So that that was coined as a way to say that people who are doing the research to come up with the evidence and the facts, um, fake news was used to say, that's not really evidence. Those aren't really facts. And so I do think that there are some simple things in terms of basic media literacy. And I think our lesson on media literacy is much, um, we'll dive much more deeply into this, but really being aware of sourcing and how to check sourcing. So .orgs, .coms, .edus, being aware that even on an EDU, you could have somebody who's a professor who's posting something that is their beliefs and not evidence-based. So having a conversation about what is evidence is going to be a super important part to this idea of civic knowledge, right? And civil, civic skill, right? So we may have a different perspective and it's okay to disagree. And are we grounding that in the same sense of fact? What evidence can we have to see? So it's okay to say that if I am Republican, I believe from my civic standpoint that really the responsibility lies in, in the hands of the state. That's my belief. And I could go back to looking up what is, you know, a traditional Republican and see that there's some of that, but that's still interpretation. And that can be discourse where I can be talking to Kendall or to Amanda who are saying, you know what, I'm a Democrat. And I believe that if we get some more centralized control over how things are handled, we're going to be working for the good of the whole. Right. And so the reality is that's a disagreement on perspective. Now, if we want to have a disagreement around like how to approach something, we could have a conversation around the same facts and how we interpret those facts in terms of advancing our argument may be slightly different, but the facts are still the facts. They're the same. And so I think that that's a super important thing to do. And I really appreciate the teachers and those participants who are putting some of those sources in there in terms of where to think about um, meaningful media literacy and fact versus fiction, fact versus an opinion. Getting students to realize that if you're reading the New York Times or the Washington Post, there's a difference between an op-ed and a cover story, an investigative piece. So I think it's important, um, one of, I would say one of our core resources in terms of thinking about civics education and media literacy is really turning to our, place, our places in Bytes Media and some of the links that I shared with you earlier. So the last piece is this idea about promoting and providing anti-bias education. And what we know is so important is that in order to, we, it's core to creating safe and inclusive school communities, that we wanna encourage students in how to understand and challenge bias and discrimination and inequities because we want people to belong. We want to be able to respond to bias incident incidences with reporting um, and conversation to prevent bullying and hatred, and that we want to look at the opportunity for long-term solutions. So it doesn't mean that you can't disagree. It means that you're still seeking understanding and you're working from the same base in terms of, you know, identities are different and important. Um, and just using the conversation that 
children are not colorblind. We see difference right away. Um, that talking about prejudice or talking about difference does not increase prejudice and that it's not enough to talk about similarities. We actually need to talk about differences as well. So um, I think that that is um, super important. The next piece that I wanna share with you is that um, the ADL website has frequent content updates. So as we look at the events of January 6th, as we looked at the role of disinformation and misinformation in spreading what happened on and encouraging the events on January 6th and the aftermath of January 6th, I want to acknowledge that we're frequently updating these resources. And so if a current issue happens and you're like, how do I talk about this? And, and it seems like conspiracy to me, go to our website. So for instance, the idea of conspiracy that Ken, Kendall talked about, about around coronavirus and infectious racism, right? So we can talk about that and we follow that model of what do we know to be true? What are some questions we can ask to engage in the conversation? How do we dig deeper? We also have blogs, so we constantly are updating information from um, the perspective of the other aspects of our organization that I think are super helpful beyond um, just the education lesson plans and table talks. The last piece that I want to share with you before we open it up for question and conversation is what do I do when it happens? So when I see or hear hate speech, how do I respond? When I see or he, um, a hate symbol, um, how do I respond? The ADL has designed what we call our incident response guide. And um, in that incident response guide, we are guided by the idea that we want to minimize harm, increase allyship, and create teachable moments. We want to talk about actions, not necessarily just actors. We want to understand the situation that took place and unpack the meaning behind that. Responding to situations are going to be slightly different for anything that we see or hear. So in our incident response guide, we have specific examples around what do I do if I see a swastika? What do I do when there's a video of students doing Heil Hitler? What happens when there's a noose at the playground nearby? What happens when I notice that a student has a Confederate flag in the background of their Zoom? And so all of these different incidences and many, many more are examples that are played out in our incident response guide. So we start with a broad overview about how to respond when, and then we give very specific examples of what if it's this or what if it's that. So it's the big and it's the specific examples. So with that, um, we'd love to open it up for some questions that you might have. And as I said, the, the um, Resources that I put in the chat, I put because I wanted them to be there contextual with the conversation I was having, but they'll be available to you in the follow-up from Amanda as well. Um, Kendall, is there anything that you wanted to add to connect in terms of thinking about um, the contextualization that you provided so thoughtfully around conspiracy theory and um, all of that, and then so the education resources before we open it up for broad questions? Um, I don't. Um, okay. I'm happy to take questions. This is, I mean, yeah, I'm happy to take questions and talk about conspiracy theories all day, not because I have them, but because I care about not having them. So happy to answer any questions folks might have too. I just want to say I'm really excited. I think this is the first time we've ever had a PD where we have like legit 15 to 20 minutes for teachers to ask questions. So I'm stoked to hear what all of you have to say. I put, you can ask your questions in the chat or if you wanna raise your hand in the participants tab, um, we can take questions. And if you want your question to be confidential, you can specifically message Kendall or Amanda or myself if it's a specific question that you didn't wanna necessarily pose to the broad audience. So you can ask it publicly or confidential, confidentially, whichever is more comfortable for you. While people are thinking and typing, um, Scotty, I'm wondering if, so you mentioned the no place for hate and like, what do you do in the moment? I'm wondering if you can just maybe share one example of if a kid is um, raising a conspiracy theory in the middle of class in response to a question, 
and without knowing what it is in particular, what are just some strategies you would do to kind of halt the spread of the conspiracy theory in the middle of class? Yeah, so one thing we always say is that there is no room for indifference. So if you do nothing, it will it, it will be out there. And so it's really important that we recognize that doing nothing is not an option. So then we think about different strategies to respond. One is to completely just say, you know, to interrupt and redirect is what we say. Uh, we're not going to talk about that right now. We're moving in this way. And then to have a conversation with that student after class is certainly one way that's appropriate. If it's connected and you feel like the conversation can be beneficial for the whole audience at a moment, it is perfectly appropriate to say to the student, can you help me understand or can you tell me more about? So those kind of open-ended questions about where the, um, why they think what they think. But I think you have to walk this fine balance between letting the conspiracy theory take the space of the classroom versus this is a this is an actual teachable moment where I think that we can we can engage in a meaningful conversation around. And so I, I it is it is okay to interrupt someone who's sharing something to redirect it back to what you were doing and where you were going and to a, have a conversation in private with the student afterwards. And then you might need to readdress it in the classroom following that situation. And I think I'd just like to echo that with uh, the Holocaust. I know we specifically say within lessons, you don't teach about denial within your unit. And so it's something that you can address separately and after. And so that's kind of what I'm hearing you say, Scotty, is like, stop, redirect, and then come back at another point if you need to, either with that student individually or later on as a class, because you're like, I heard some people saying this, and it sounds like we need to talk about where you're getting your news from and how are you discerning this information? So kind of making it its own separate lesson rather than addressing it in the moment. So this way you don't have the pressure on yourself as a teacher to be like, crap, how do I respond to this in the moment um, and give yourself some time and space? Yeah, so good question, elementary or secondary? Um, so the ADL has some resources um, to address conversations both at the elementary and secondary level. So one thing that we're in the process, process of preparing and um, it's not quite done yet, but there are gonna be some student facing what I would call asynchronous learning opportunities now that we're all into those words, right? Where we have these mini lessons, we have one for upper elementary school and one for high school that specifically talk about online spaces and places where kids are made to feel uncomfortable. I would say another place to think about addressing this in elementary school is really through the lens of anti-bias. Um, what we know is that if we don't have conversations early on about identity and difference, then we can make assumptions about things that we don't know. We have early, we have lessons for elementary school too around, we may not address it around conspiracy theory, but we may say something about stereotypes, right? And so it's thinking about what's an age appropriate way to have the conversation based on what we hear from students. Um, There's yeah, another question about um, impact of using conspiracy theories as jokes. Yeah, I think that that's a really important piece to think about too. Um, the idea of, um, it, I always struggle with the word microaggression. I know that's what we're using in term, and it's, and it's an important word to know and understand. It's those pieces where we may not even know that what we're doing is harmful, but it is harmful. And there are many microaggressions that show up as jokes. And so I think that the important piece too is to address the joke the same way you would address some other situations in terms of interrupting in the moment. I heard you say, can you help me understand why that's funny? Or, you know, I heard this, ouch, that made me feel uncomfortable. Can you help me understand? You know, so call, giving pause is I think certainly important and addressing how it made you feel is one way to think about it too. 
Yeah, and I'll put it on um, in the um, in the resources list in the follow up email. But Western State Center had an excellent recent blog post that came out that details. Excellent. It's a six part blog post that details exactly what you can say. So if you are looking for a script of some sort, uh, that would be it. But based off of how students are engaging. So if it is a joke, how do you question them? without uh, shaming them versus if they are a true believer, where do you start that conversation? Um, and Ken will always chime in too when you have something to add to. Um, he's a wealth of information. Um, I would say in terms of, um, I'm gonna pull a little bit on my Brene Brown right? So people know that uh, Amanda and Kendall hear me talk about her all the time. I'm definitely got some fangirl going on there. One thing we have to acknowledge is that we don't want to shame the person. We want to talk about the action, right? There's a very big difference there. So if a student is spouting a conspiracy theory or is showing some sense of vulnerability, to go ahead and make that person feel bad about their beliefs or their understandings or their interpretations is actually going to make it worse. So it's more about understanding the action and what we heard, not about the person, right? So we're seeking understanding, we're seeking clarity, and we're addressing the action or the event or the story. We are not making that person feel badly for what they have said and what they believe. So I think that that's one thing that's super important. And then the other piece is um, I see um, this idea of a true believer um, versus stirring the pot. Really good question, right? Like the true believer is going to be a much longer process to go through and is going to take more of a team effort um, in terms of engaging families in the conversation, engaging peers in the conversation. You're not acting alone. And so how do we work with that child if we realize that they genuinely believe one of those pieces um, versus a kid who's stirring, stirring the pot? That's where that interrupt and redirect comes in so handy and having a conversation with that student afterwards. Um, you know, so not even giving it airspace when it is. However, when it's taking place in a chat in a virtual conversation, it can't go unaddressed. So Kendall, I see that you've posted something in the chat. I'm, it's making me feel uncomfortable right now. We'll talk about it later, but, but we can't engage in that conversation. You know, so it's super appropriate to do that. You scared me for a second there, Scotty. <laughs> me too. I was like, uh, he didn't write anything in the chat. And did you just call him out on that? Um, I totally did. But Maureen, I think even just based off of what Scotty's saying, that's a really good opportunity to model with your students. How do we call in, call out people um, in a way that doesn't shame them? Because I think cancel culture is so out there right now and kids are just clinging on to cancel culture that how do we actually share with them that cancel culture is harmful and dangerous and not productive in the long run we have a great lesson on um our bites media page two about debate versus discourse because the reason why i reference that is because i feel like what's happened with cancel culture is that we've gotten to the point where we've said oh you voted for, I'm not gonna listen to you anymore. You did this, I'm not gonna talk to you anymore. And again, it's that idea of somebody may have done a certain action or done a certain thing and to disregard them entirely is harmful, right? We've forgotten how to engage in meaningful conversation to seek to understand and to agree to disagree. Now, obviously, if it's a conspiracy theory and a total falsehood, that becomes a different space and place. But regarding cancel culture, um, I do think it's important that we, we definitely go back into this idea of what is discourse? How do we engage in? Ralph, I see your hands up. Okay, my questions, or maybe it's a question slash comment that's been brewing in my brain a little bit. Um, in, in our discourse space, in the USA, like these far, 
these conspiracy theories we're all describing, they're far right conspiracy theories. They're anti-Semitic, they're anti-Black, they're anti-Asian. They combine those things. They're on the far right. And as you come off the come into the middle, you know, there, there's gradations of these theories. There's this piece of when we talk about extremism, you know, people on the right talk about things like Black Lives Matter as being an extremist movement. Mm -hmm. That's a racial justice movement, but it is outside the norm of the discussion in the United States, right? The Derek Chauvin trial, most people who know about the issues are expecting him to be released. So like, for me, like the question is like that last point that you shared, Scotty, about building an anti-bias space, right? It's like, I feel like in these discussions, we often get really focused on, okay, how are we going to respond to this particular little neo-Nazi in training, whether they're six years old or 16 or 26, where I teach at PCC. When I'd really, you know, like that building that space is so key and like fake news getting applied to like, if it applies to like the really bad actors, truly anti-Semitic bad guys, but then people are like talking about the middle all the time. It's pretty challenging because people on the, the left want justice and want freedom, right? I'm just, I'm wondering like how to, mm. how to focus on building that, focus on freedom so that when these actions happen, the majority of children are like, yeah, let's go for freedom. Let's go for anti-racism. Let's go for loving Jewish people. Let's do it, you know? So the anti-bias framework that we use at the ADL always starts with identity. And one of the pieces of power that I find about that is that we have identities that we're born with and identities that we choose. And by framing the conversation around nobody's identities that people were born with, they didn't have a choice. So to make someone feel bad or wrong because of something they were born with, right, is, is a very difficult and, and in a, I mean, it, it's not okay, right? And so when anybody can put down on the paper, these are my identities in which I was born with, and these are identities that I, that I chose. But when we begin the conversation with these are identities that I was born with, I think it helps us to begin the conversation around, um, um, to move away from good and bad and to move towards we are different. And I think that's at the core of all of this work. So whether you're talking about someone like Ibram Kendi, who's out there, right, talking about anti-racism work, or you're doing what the ADL does, which is talk about anti-bias work, or somewhere in between, right, we know that kids are learning and understanding difference as early as age three. So to not talk about it is a problem. And by starting by talking about it with identity, we find that there's a way to connect around this is who I am and this is how I was born. And with that, this is, this is how I feel about it. And how do I begin to engage in conversation who was born with different identities? And that we may choose so even though I was born with a set of identities and Kendall was born with a set of identities and you can make assumptions by looking at the two of us on the screen, right? Um, there are things that we have in common even though we have differences. And so starting with self and then building those bridges and, and connections around common pieces begin, I think, to make the conversation easier. When you listen to people a couple years ago, the ADL, um, our Pacific Northwest, we had, I forget his name, Kendall, the guy who was a, um, in the, a neo-Nazi and has come out and talks. What's his name? Christian Piccolini. Yes. You know, it was through understanding his own identity and realizing he was connecting with people who had identities that he was hating that he began to change. And so for me, that's always the starting point, so. And Ralph, I think, you know, you bring up a really good point of wanting to equate two things. And again, finding something on the right to balance out something on the left or vice versa. 
And I think being really honest with students and helping them recognize that, like just talking about that of like, why do we need to balance something when there should be nothing to balance? Like these are not on the same playing field and let's discuss why, like let's investigate why they even aren't on the same spectrum. Let's look at the motives behind this. Let, let's look at who's, who, it's, who it is affecting, how people are going about it. And like, especially at a college level, you can definitely dive a little bit deeper into that. But even on news networks, like you often find people wanting to be like, let's have somebody, I, I remember before with like climate change years ago, where it's like, you'd have somebody like sharing about climate change. And it's like, well, on the other side, we have somebody who doesn't believe in it just to balance out the sides. And you're like, this is not, no, there, no, these are not two sides. And so just opening up that conversation with your students, I think can be really, really beneficial to say, oh, it doesn't have to be a balancing act. And why is that okay? Yeah, a, a little racism is too much for the culture, for our lives, right? I, I think one, one like classroom move that I've liked, it works with grownups, is when you deal with an incident and I, I would just imagine it would work with any group of human beings. The question you asked, you try to get everybody to understand what happened and why it hurts, right? Why people are hurt by the N-word being graffitied in our classroom, right? Why people are hurt by the swastikas around the neighborhood, around the campus, why it's hurtful. When they get to that point, there's the question you can ask, okay, what will we do about it? How will we make our community stronger so it won't happen again? It's a really hard question, but every time children or adults think about it, we can make a little action. And that was, Scotty, you kept saying action again and again. That's the one that kept coming to mind. The question, what will we do? Yeah. Now that we know what we know, what will we do? We inherited a system. We didn't create the system. How do we stop perpetuating the system? Right? So we didn't create it. And I think that that's important to help students understand too. Um, so with just a couple minutes left, um, how do we address situations where students who have otherwise been diligent students begin refusing to do work when they notice a diversified curriculum? I think the key there is diversified curriculum that all students need to be able to see themselves in the curriculum. Um, and I think that for a long time, that wasn't the case. Um, whose story is being told and so when a student who's a diligent student is refusing to do something, I think the first question is to have a conversation about why. Um, I think that a second piece to keep in mind is by creating activities in the classroom where all of those narratives and all of those, those pieces and perspectives get shared in your classroom regardless of who does the homework. Um, so I think that that's something that's super helpful so everybody has an opportunity to hear it. Um, and I think holding students accountable for the work that they're supposed to do is certainly part of it. So if there's a consequence for not doing work, the choice for not reading the story about somebody who doesn't look like them um, because they don't believe it, the reality is, is they don't have a choice to believe that that person has a story and a perspective. So if you choose not to do this work, there will be a consequence. And I think that that's okay. Um, I also just want to add on to that. Posing the way to kind of conclude is Ellie just getting everybody going and motivating all of us. I think you said it so well. I would say the one other thing I was going to add was um, asking students, like, what can they learn from others? What can they gain from learning from others? Because I like that's so important is what do other people help teach us not only about ourselves, but what do they contribute to our community? So, um, but wow, this has been amazing. I want to thank everybody for coming, for staying on, for Kendall on his day off, coming and speaking with us, and Scotty for just sharing nuggets of knowledge. I put in the chat, and I will again, the link for the survey. Um, again, I'll send it in a follow-up email. I did just add a question in the middle of this that was like, if you want to share any resources, please put them in there with a with the link or whatever. I did open up most of the ones that you shared in the chat today. 
Um, but I will share Scotty and Kendall's uh, contact information as well as their slides in the follow up email. But again, thank you both for such a powerful presentation. I know I took so much away from it. Um, my gears are turning. Um, and have a great night, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you.